longevity study progressing in the next few years? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I think that, that there's there's lots of stuff that's going to happen. So the first thing I would say is it is going to be, things are going to change. The landscape is going to change dramatically, I think, in the next decade. In part, that's because there are, there's signs at least that there are going to be many more resources coming into the field. So there's certainly been a, a pretty dramatic uptick in attention that the field's getting, um, uh, particularly in the sort of popular culture realm. And again, I think there's pluses and minuses to that. That's not all good, <laughs> but there's certainly the field is more visible among the general public now than it was five years ago. And I, that's definitely going to continue. And there are signs that there's going to be continued influx of resources into the field that you know may double, triple, quadruple the resources that are going towards research. So that's fantastic. That means we're going to have more scientists in the field. We have more companies being spun out. We're going to have more discoveries. Um, my hope is that at least some of those increased resources will be diverted towards what I would consider high risk, high reward projects instead of what I have you know, sort of dismissively called cookie cutter projects. Um, and I don't want to demean cookie cutter projects. Those are important. We need the incremental stuff. Absolutely. I would just like to see a little bit more of the move the needle, high risk, high reward research being funded. And I'm hopeful that will happen. Um, so I think that's going to, I think that's going to happen and we will see a lot of advances. The other thing that I think is going to happen is we will start to see some of these companies, even though most of them right now are taking the traditional biotech approach one molecule, one indication, go through FDA clinical trials. What we're starting to see are companies that are doing that, but they're doing that with the underlying uh, approach that the drug they're interested in targets the biology of aging. So it's a geroscience approach. It's just that they've picked an indication where they think they can get FDA approval. So we're starting to see those things get into the FDA pipeline. And I think the more that, the more that, that happens, the more discussion there is going to be among regulators and among policymakers about, you know, how do we create a structure here that is going to allow us to evaluate geroscience interventions and hopefully accelerate the process that we can bring these geroscience interventions to market. And, and so I think that's going to happen. In fact, I know there's already movement uh, in conversations on the political side in the United States. There's a longevity caucus now in the United States House of Representatives. So there's starting to be some political discussion, some, some traction here to get buy-in, hopefully, from policymakers and regulators. And that could be game-changing, right? So if FDA gets on board with a geroscience fast track, for example, that would encourage companies to develop molecules based on targeting the biology of aging, that could dramatically accelerate the pace at which we have interventions actually go through the clinical trial process, which as we've already talked about is important um, and get to, to market. So, you know, it's hard to predict what's actually going to happen, but I'm kind of optimistic that those things are already starting to percolate up and that we'll see some, some movement there. And then hopefully, whether it's the million molecule challenge or it's somebody else thinking outside the box, hopefully what we'll see are some new discoveries that kind of change the game, that get us past rapamycin to something that's bigger, better, can have a, a larger effect. And maybe it'll be rapamycin plus something else, right? I don't know how that's going to play out. But the point is, I hope that we don't have another 20 years where nobody does better than rapamycin. I hope that in the next few years, we will in fact start to see things that really do move the needle beyond what we've already got. I know you you have kind of an interest in personalized medicine as well, I think. Yeah. So you would think that that is, I mean, because we have the technology now uh, to be able to monitor people and to use personalized medicine, that would be able to move the needle, or at least try and recover this lost decade. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right in a sense. I think the challenge is we have the technology to measure a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> I think the problem is we don't yet know what to do with that data to really really personalized. The personalization piece is still pretty rudimentary. I think we'll get closer, but but at least for now, a lot of the technologies and I and and you know, I think there's two pieces actually to the to the to the to personalized approach. One is we have a bunch of things we can measure to tell you whether you're on the path to a disease or if you have a pre-existing disease. That's super important. That we can do now. 
And we've, we've been able to do that for a while, but I think it's gotten a lot better with the, the early detection, early disease detection or pre-disease detection. That's something we can do now to keep people from getting a pathology that could kill them. And that's an area that I'm very interested in. And, and, and I think there are lots of opportunities there. What is not yet ready for prime time is, you know, look at the metabolome, epigenome, microbiome, proteome, integrate all that data, and then have artificial intelligence spit out a personalized lifestyle plan for you. Um, that I, I think we're still a ways away from that. That we could get there. I'm not saying it's impossible to get there, but I don't think we know, we know enough yet to be able to actually, it's, it's, it's not only about gathering the data, measuring things. We actually have to be able to interpret that data in a way where we can have some confidence that for you as an individual, what we recommend is actually going to, to optimize or maximize your health span. So right now we're still at the, the stage of, okay, exercise more. I think we can do a little bit there. We can say, okay, you need to do a little bit more in this domain of exercise because we think these biomarkers are important. You know, we're seeing a loss of bone mineral density. So you need to do this. But I don't think we're to the point where we can be very specific from a personalized nutrition, personalized exercise, personalized medication plan yet. That'll be, that'll happen. And, you know, how quickly it happens and how quickly we get to where the Holy Grail, right? Which is a specifically personalized, I mean, I don't really like the word optimized because optimal is something I don't think we're ever going to get there, but, but close, right? Something that is really meaningfully optimized to get you from eat better exercise to here's exactly what, what will with some level of, you know, probability, again, this is going to be probabilistic, but where we can say 95% probability, if you do this, you're going to make it to age 80 without a significant pre-existing disease. I think that's possible, but I think we're still a ways away from having that algorithm worked out, but, but we could get there. And the tools, you know, the tools are, uh, you know, uh, uh, developing sort of an amazingly rapid pace. So we'll see, maybe, maybe that's doable in the next decade. I don't know. Interesting. So one last question. So since we spoke two years ago, I think it was about two years ago, uh, it's kind of, has anything changed with, in your mind with respect to what we should do for optimal aging? I mean, Huh. It's a good question. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know for sure if I can answer that. Cause I honestly don't know what my mind was two years ago, <laughs> a little bit hard, you know, especially with COVID, like what was two years oh, yeah. ago? How, wh where was I then? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I would say, I don't think anything has changed dramatically. Right. I don't right. think there's anything now that, that I would say now that me two years ago would look at that and be like, that's crazy. Or I never mm -hmm. thought of that. I think it's been more, it's been more incremental. I think what has, what has changed for me is my personal understanding of, you know, which biomarkers I think are most important, which diagnostics I think are most valuable. Um, and, and my own personal understanding of my physiology has changed. I think definitely my health status today is far better than it was two years ago, my personal mm -hmm. health status. And in part, that's because I've learned a lot and I've, mm -hmm. I've done exploring and I've taken the time to put the effort in to figure out what works and also to put the effort in effort in, in terms of, you know, nutrition and exercise and, um, and paying attention. So, so I think I've learned more there, but I can't point to anything that I would say, you know, has really changed my worldview on health span. Um, you know, and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, but, but I, I can't think of anything huge that, that's changed dramatically. Okay. No, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cablin, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it was uh, great talking to you again. Um, and hopefully we can uh, have a chat again in the future. Well, thank you. It's always fun.